So here it is, Baldur's Gate 3 on PS5. Where do you even start with a game of this magnitude? It's a sequel to two of the most legendary RPGs of all time, but it's the latest game from Larian Studios, too. A huge RPG success story in their own right. Then on top of that, there's the Dungeons & Dragons of it all. This is an attempt to crush the popular 5th edition rule set into a manageable video game form. All those funny role players you like on the internet? This is like your own private version of that. Or not private, if you decide to share a campaign with your own not-quite-as-funny friends. What really tickles me is that Baldur's Gate 3 somehow manages to be one of the highest-reviewed games of all time, and also a game where I can win a dice roll to slide a goblin's toe into my mouth. As your lips touch filthy flesh, you catch a whiff of lavender? What I'm saying is, it contains multitudes. The game, that is, not my mouth. Though actually a goblin toe isn't the worst thing that's gone in my gob in Baldur's Gate 3. This is all a long-winded way of saying there are a thousand ways into this game and a thousand ways to celebrate it. Perhaps the place to start this video is with the only thing every playthrough will have in common, and that's the introduction of a Mind Flayer tadpole to your hero's eye. It's a ticking time bomb that will transform its host, just like this poor lady here, emerging from the smoke like she's on stars in their eyes. Tonight, Matthew, I'm gonna be a hideous tentacled freak! Even worse news, there's no NHS hotline or WebMD in Faerun, so you've got to find a fix before you turn full Squidward. That shared concept aside, though, all bets are off, and we're back to the puzzle of how to talk about Baldur's Gate 3. In the most meat-and-potatoes way, it's a party-based RPG with turn-based combat. It's not a free-roaming open world, it's more like exploring through a highly detailed model. A fantasy diorama that's constantly revealing crypts, caves, chapels, and other fantasy places also beginning with C. Pretty enough to paint. Too bad I don't have a canvas. Or paints. Or the skills. You can uncover all kinds of hidden nooks with jumps or magical levitation, meaning you really want to take your time and pick over it. Enter a fight and time halts. Initiative is rolled, a turn order is decided, and you start plotting how to best position yourself with limited movement and what to spend action points on. I'm definitely oversimplifying this, but I do not have five hours to break down the D&D rulebook that shapes these encounters. I will say Larian do a good job of squeezing very complicated movesets onto a series of radial menus. Entirely customizable, but in a brilliant touch, they group your class's defining moves in the first style to give you good pointers of where to start. You can also tap the touchpad to bring up a glossary that explains mechanics you might not be familiar with, like advantage or saving rolls, right down to tiny details of each specific ability. It's still a lot, and this is a system clearly designed to be mastered over an 80-hour campaign. But you can sense Larian have your back. Between this and Final Fantasy XVI's active time lore, glossaries have had a defining year, huh? In 2023. I guess technically, though, every year is a defining year for glossaries. Little bit of glossary humour for you there. Now, back to the bigger picture and the challenge of neatly encapsulating BG3. I'm tempted to go all in on D&D fidelity and the magic of seeing classes that usually exist in the theatre of the mind rendered into digital flesh. Things like the motion-captured slaps that let you go full Neo as a monk, or the endless comedy of throwing shoes as a barbarian. You can turn those hush puppies into crush puppies, am I right? But please do throw them back, my feet now hurt. Or, if you'd rather not get chucked out of Foot Locker, at the stealthier end of the scale you have your cleric Shadow Heart and her ability to disguise herself in any body, all with their teeny tiny version of her outfit and those sharp words piping out of them. Let's hope any future acquaintances don't hold a blade to your throat by way of introduction. It's not just for show, either. One time I found a hole none of the party could enter, until I transformed Shadow Heart into a gnome and slipped my diminutive bod into a hidden cave beneath. And that's the fun to be had from just one power of over 600. If you play as a spellcasting class, who in D&D have to preload spells into slots like you'd load into the chamber of a gun, the wall of potential magics that meets you is genuinely overwhelming. Do I want to cover my enemies in grease like the slippery pig of the icon, or do I want to rain down fiery death? Obviously, the correct answer is to cover them in grease and then ignite them with a fireball. Or the classic burning hands. Mmm, just how Mother used to cook her ghouls. And I have done exactly what I said I wasn't going to do. Got distracted and went down a rabbit hole. Quite literally in the case of Shadowheart. But it is so easily done in Baldur's Gate 3. This is a game where every threat, no matter how innocent or innocuous, takes you somewhere. 
You walk down a path and the next thing you know, a hyena is giving birth to some bloodied monstrosity and you're in the fight for your life. Or you enter a goblin-infested fortress and are given three targets to kill, only to realise that you're now in a fantasy hitman level. Though Agent 47 didn't have the option to side with the targets, romance them and pursue a path of world-ruining evil. Pick a direction, any direction, and mad, weird, beautiful things will await. But the direction I'm picking for this video, finally, revolves around a sound effect. A sound effect at the heart of Baldur's Gate 3 that I feel perfectly captures what makes this a perfect RPG. Any guesses? No, it isn't the dog I talk to using speak-to-animal magic. Hope you're keeping well, friend. It certainly isn't whatever foul act is going on inside here. As you approach, a guttural scream and a succession of quick bangs rattle the door. What happens in the barn stays in the barn. It isn't even this banging bit of music from Divinity Original Sin 2 that you can play on your loot. No, the effect is this. That's the noise of the world entering turn-based mode. Like I said, combat is already turn-based, but you can also press a button to explore in this way, where the party takes a move and then the world takes its move. You might not use it often, but it allows you to finesse things. Maybe you trip a trap and want to carefully creep out. Perhaps you're trying to sneak around shifting enemy view cones. Point is, it is very useful and it makes this cool noise. To my ear, this sounds like gears grinding to a halt, like the world of Faerun is some vast mechanical device, a machine you can pause to better inspect and navigate all its moving parts. In some ways, this is literally true. If you want to, you can bring up a combat log and see exactly how Baldur's Gate 3 calculated its outcomes. You can see the invisible dice rolls behind combat and understand why it was that an arrow with 80% chance of landing still managed to miss. Swear all you like, the proof is there. But more than this, every time I hear that k-clunk, it kind of reminds me that this adventure is an incredible narrative machine, and it's a machine built to tailor a story exactly to you. Yes, yes, that isn't new in games. We've all written our version of The Walking Dead or the Mass Effect trilogy, or chosen an infinite variety of lives in Skyrim or Elden Ring, some of them involving no clothes. But the Baldur's Gate 3 version is such a good take on it. At the top of the food chain, you have the big ticket choices and consequences. There is something dreadful in your head. What are you going to do about it? You'll meet endless people offering solutions, from the surgical to the infernal. There are a wealth of dark bargains to be struck. And honestly, going along with some of them took us to wild places and changed our heroes irrevocably. And that's before you consider the flip side. What if your condition wasn't a curse? but an opportunity. You know, like how having terrible flu lets you stay home and enjoy bargain hunt reruns. The darkest bargain of all. Those dilemmas would be enough, but the choices keep filtering down. Almost every interaction is peppered with skill checks, where you get to gamble on a decision with the roll of an on-screen die. These range from scaring off a potential attacker or translating a big spooky book to some stupidly high-stakes scenarios. Think permanently alienating a party member or killing off key characters. I thought maybe you could be a friend. I could have done with one of those. It gives the roles powerful drama. Honestly, it is a streamer's dream game, but never feels willfully punishing. Oh, dumb! Hilarious things can happen if you fail, and terrible things can occur if you succeed at a bad decision. Sure, you can quick load to a happier ending, but it's a testament to Larian's writers that we roll with the outcomes. Better or worse, they make the journey feel like your own, and it leaves thousands of permutations on the table for the inevitable replays. And under all those external pressures, you have your hero and the game's greatest trick of all. Whether you build a custom protagonist from class, race and background, or choose to play as one of the companions who will otherwise join you on the adventure, the circumstances of that life are constantly bubbling up when you least suspect it. A half-elf monk often has the chance to de-escalate heated arguments with monkish calm, whilst also tapping into his green-fingered roots to calm animals and sense nature out of whack. A dwarven fighter or vampire spawn rogue will find entirely different avenues to explore. One of those moments that blows you away is when Will, a one-eyed warlock, uses his speak-to-animals ability to not only converse with an owlbear, but to find common ground with it because it too had lost an eye in the past. 
You'll be missing more than your eye before I'm done. Imagine that! A whole exchange written just in case a one-eyed Dr. Doolittle walks into that cave. This is Baldur's Gate 3's greatest trick. A sense that whatever you throw at it, the writers have anticipated it and are ready to catch you. It honestly feels like a tale custom written for you. So when I'm saying that it feels mechanical, it isn't because it's cold and lifeless, but because it feels so intricately made, so carefully pieced together by a human hand. Don't get me wrong, Baldur's Gate 3 also has a spark of unpredictable life. There's an emergent science to what happens if this spell collides with that spell. Or if you build the Leaning Tower of Pisa out of barrels, or steal all of the enemy's weapons before a fight kicks off. Put your mind to it and you can push at the game's boundaries in extraordinary ways. But holding it all together is good old-fashioned storytelling, only told in a way that could ever work in a video game. So yes, enjoy all the thirsty romances. We should have had wine more often. More warming than the fire. Dig deep into the mechanics, cherish your companions, and steel your heart against inevitable betrayals. As I said, Baldur's Gate 3 contains multitudes. But the way it takes the role-playing in role-playing game and strives to meet you on your terms is what makes Baldur's Gate 3 so special. And a perfect RPG. Words of mine will turn to ash when you call the last light down. So, will you be feeding a tadpole into your eye on PS5? Let me know in the comments what you're playing as, Loth Sworn Drow Druid over here, and the wildest stuff you've seen. And if you enjoyed these impressions, please do the lawful good thing and give this video a like and subscribe to PlayStation Access for more exciting coverage of everything PlayStation. Thanks for watching. Station.